I would like to move our amendment just to say that before I start, but I'll come back to it again at the end and also before I start on what I have to say to thank the chairperson, uh, Hildegard Nocton, for the great job she did on chairing the committee that brought about this report. Um, uh, the starting point, however, I think should be the other reports that are constantly being produced, that are being brought out probably now on a daily basis. This one today, the EU Overshoot Day, Living Beyond Nature's Limits, uh, published on the 10th of May 2019. And this one I got this morning from DCU, from a researcher called Paul Price. And he looks at uh, what we need to do to rapidly make a transition to a fossil uh, a fossil free um, society in Ireland and he bases his study on the national the current national energy and climate plan and I know it's difficult to see but basically what he's trying to show us with this graph is this for, for to have our carbon emissions where they need to be we need to be up here where we are is down here and what this report plans to give us is in between the two so it falls short of what needs to be done. And that's the starting point that I'd uh, like to start with, not to be a naysayer, but to say that we're not doing enough, that we're not moving rapidly enough, and we're not uh, at the scale and the speed that's required to deal with the loss of both species and biodiversity, biodiversity on the planet, but also to deal with the question of our, of our emissions. And these reports are interesting. I do hope you'll all look at them. Uh, and they do talk to us again and again about what we need to do to reduce our emissions and to be optimistic about the scenarios that we can have for the future. And I don't think that this report goes far enough in that. Uh, to paraphrase Greta Thornburg, these reports should make us panic. That's what she says. We need to panic as politicians. And she's right. The stark realisation that we're living through a mass species extinction, a million species um, have been lost, and uh, are about, uh, we're heading for that direction, the loss of a million species. Um, we're now committed to trends that place a question mark over the future of ourselves as a species. And the official policy of the state is to effectively ignore these facts and proceed with plans and policies, aside from the odd PR release or spin, ignore these realities. We need to panic, Minister. And so you would think that in that context, I would be welcoming a, a, a report that's, that's titled Climate Change Across Party Consensus for Action. Well, my first comment on it is that it is not a cross-party consensus. I have written to the chairperson and to the minister today to ask for that to be corrected. Uh, there are two parties who did not consensually adopt this report, and that needs to be put on the record. I've also written and asked for the record to be changed in relation to an amendment I put through and was accepted on a just transition for workers, and that amendment is importantly was altered, not by us, uh, not, what, not what we voted on, but it was altered to exclude uh, peat workers from the possibility of the state uh, taking care of pensions and conditions of those workers. I've written it in the email and I hope uh, that you will consider very strongly making those adjustments. We contributed and participated in this committee for months. We took it very seriously. And in every chapter, we suggested recommendations and policies that we believed could have an effect. And in fairness, in many occasions, the committee listened to us and tried to adopt some of the positions on those issues, issues such as fuel poverty, uh, the need to protect workers in the industries affected, the kind of the role that the state should play uh, in delivering renewables, um, and the role of the fossil fuel industry in hampering and hindering the actions that we need to take. Other things they didn't take on board, like, for example, a proposal to work towards delivering free public transport in the future. But this report is too modest and too meek, and it lacks the ambition that in many areas is really needed. Um, I think if this report had been produced 10, 20 years ago, we might have said this is progress. But given what we now know and what on a daily basis is being alerted to us by scientists who are screaming at us, uh, as I say on a daily basis, the report is mild and a bit outdated. But the key issue that I have, aside from the aspirational nature and not the concrete nature of the report, is the proposal on carbon tax or, as it's called in the report, incentivising climate action. Firstly, what is the tax on? Who is it on? And how do the supporters of the tax think that it will reduce our carbon emissions? Effectively, the carbon tax or the increase in it is on 
the consumption of fossil fuel energy by ordinary people on their energy bills, on their transport bills, on their heating bills. And it suggests, therefore, that if these bills rise, it will incentivise ordinary people to turn away from their high carbon use and adopt alternative renewable sources of energy, transport and heating. It is true there are lots of good ideas and suggestions in the report, but there's only one policy that I am absolutely confident that this government and its successors will actually enact, and that is the trajectory for raising carbon taxes on ordinary people. We can dress this up as what we want, but the ideology behind this proposal is that ordinary people's personal behaviour and choices are the key to reducing carbon emissions. If they change their behaviour, if we all change our behaviour and all the people out there who may be listening, that will encourage the market and private enterprise to provide all the alternatives that we need. This, in fact, won't work, and it's a dangerous illusion. The problem is not the personal behaviour of ordinary people. The problem is systemic. It's connected to the economic system we live under. It's connected to the drive for profit and competition, and the way that the fossil fuel industry and the giant corporations attached to it are at the heart of that system, the system of capitalism that has developed over the last 200 years. We use fossil fuels because that is where the greatest profits and returns and the largest investments are to be had. We have failed to reduce our emissions because of the opposition from the fossil fuel giants who deny the science and deny the link between fossil fuel and climate change. These giant uh, corporations have funded cli uh, climate scepticism, they have funded climate deniers, they've sought to delay and undermine scientists who have been trying to raise awareness. And they have bought and influenced governments who pursue policies that have meant that society has remained addicted to and continues to use fossil fuels and continues the extraction of oil, coal and gas. Last year, almost 30 years after the first IPCC report and decades after the inconvenient truth, began, the, the scientists began screaming at governments, humanity emitted more CO2 than ever before in human history. Not less, not the same, but the greatest volume of CO2 from human uh, industry, human consumption and other sources. That failure places a question mark over the future habitability of this planet. That failure has come 30 years of failed market mechanisms that were introduced, such as carbon trading, carbon offsets, dubious schemes and scams that provided a few windfall profits, but failed to reduce or even address the global rate of CO2 emissions. Carbon taxes on ordinary people is another market mechanism that will fail to reduce CO2 uh, emissions. Carbon tax seeks to suggest that the problem is individual choices and that tweaking market signals can achieve the historic and huge task that we face. The market will not provide the solution because to a large extent the free market is the source of the problem. It is a system based on endless growth, on endless need to accumulate and accumulate for profit's sake and to expand and to create new markets to accumulate again. The measures humanity needs to take fly in the face of the very reason that free market capitalism exists in the first place. But it's not true that it means demanding sacrifices from ordinary people or lowering our living standards. Free and plentiful public transport energy efficient homes, properly planned towns and villages and cities and a switch to state run renewable energies, especially in offshore wind, are not a sacrifice for ordinary people but could be a huge gain for people and the planet. The measures needed to require to bring the mass of people with us in tackling climate change are, the, are, are those I listed above. But what do carbon taxes say to those people? They say you're the problem, not ExxonMobil, not Shell, not the giant uh, corporations that continue to extract the fossil fuels. We will increase heating and transport costs by not providing alternatives in public transport or renewable energy. This is a guaranteed way to alienate ordinary people and lose them in the battle and allow climate sceptics to say to them, listen, it's all a hoax to, designed to make you pay more while the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. I have constituents, as all of you have, who face fuel poverty and cannot access uh, the fuel allowance and their bills will go up and they will be seriously uh, asked to accept that we mean what we say when we talk about reducing uh, reducing our, our carbon emissions. I just want to finish by making an appeal to the Green Party, de Green Party deputies to remove 
the amendment that they have placed before the House because what it does is it says to us that we must accept the report in full when we clearly have already voted against it in order to accept that we need to declare a climate emergency. Of course we need to declare a climate emergency. The bill I have struggled to get to committee stage, which will hopefully be there in June, is called the Climate Emergency Measures Bill. Of course we accept a climate emergency, but we're not going to be bounced into accepting a carbon tax on ordinary people for all the reasons I've outlined. Thank you, Deputy. I'm now calling Deputy Catherine Connolly. First of all,